March 1944, Allied aircraft are flying over Vesuvius. Impressive wreaths of ash are shooting up from the crater to a height of 5,000 meters. Lava flows are invading the villages of San Sebastian and Massa. The fear and anger of the inhabitants gives way little by little to incomprehension and resignation. For thousands of years, volcanic eruptions were considered an expression of the anger of the gods. In Greco-Roman mythology, they were the home of Vulcan and Hephaestus, the gods of Hades. Then, with the Christian Middle Ages, these same volcanoes were seen as the den of Satan. When man is confronted with the mysteries of nature, religion provides answers and the comforting protection of the patron saints, the miracle workers. Down through the centuries, long periods of calm would dim the memory of the deadly eruptions. So people have always lived in the vicinity of the volcanoes of southern Italy. Vesuvius, which seems to be sleeping soundly since its last eruption in 1944, towers over Naples and its suburbs, a metropolitan area of close to two million inhabitants. Numerous quarries have been dug out of the slopes of Vesuvius. For a volcanologist like Claudia Principe, they are like open books on Vesuvius's history. If we observe this quarry from the bottom up, we can see the layers of volcanic deposits over the period A.D. 472 to 1822. The traces from the 1822 eruption are naturally found on top. But in addition to the field work on a site like this, to really understand a volcano, it's also very important to gather information from the eyewitness accounts of those who lived at the different periods of volcanic activity. These two types of data taken together are really an effective way to get a complete picture of the volcano's history and perhaps understand certain phenomena that didn't leave any traces in the rock, like how long it took for a lava flow to reach the sea, what was the exact time that the eruption began, when did it stop, a whole set of observations that go into making up a physical model of the eruption. The image of Vesuvius overlooking the Bay of Naples has now become an asset that attracts millions of tourists every year. As for the Neapolitans, they seem less worried about a new eruption than about the traffic congestion in downtown Naples. This same lack of concern may have already been the general attitude several thousand years ago. In Nola, a few kilometers from Naples, the archaeologist Claude Alboré Livadi has unearthed a group of dwellings dating back to the Bronze Age. The archaeologist and the volcanologist have joined forces in an attempt to describe what happened here. The region was dotted with small farming communities when, in 1800 BC, the extremely violent eruption called the Avellino Pumice eruption took place. A flow of volcanic mud flooded the village and hardened, fixing into a natural mold all sorts of objects, and also, for the first time, the form of the dwellings of that period. 
Right now in this 1,500 square meter sector at NOLA, we have just three houses. More importantly, we have pens for animals and a threshing floor. We have the wheat, or sprigs of wheat, barley still stored in jars. We have very specific details. For example, we found a certain number of nanny goats, nine to be exact, that were being kept in one pen, and they were about to give birth, so they couldn't be transported. And we found a dog that was hidden inside the house. He hid and he died asphyxiated because he didn't want to follow his masters. And that, again, is a very interesting situation that has been fossilized. We can't affirm that people had been living on the slopes of Vesuvius since the dawn of time because we don't have the evidence. We'd have to dig much deeper, go down to observe other eruptions, the filigreen fields eruptions, the eruptions of grey tuff, of yellow Neapolitan tuff that covered the whole plain to a depth of several hundred meters. And there we might find signs of previous settlements, from the Paleolithic age, the Upper Paleolithic in particular, and more recent periods. Those eruptions took place between 35,000 and 15,000 years ago. The villages of Nola, the Romans of Pompeii, and the Neapolitans of the 17th century, they lived hundreds of years apart. Yet they all had no more than their beliefs to explain the outbursts of Vesuvius. Down through the centuries, the most far-fetched theories were advanced to explain the eruptions, the emission of gases, and the lava flows. Empedocles was the exception. Already in the 4th century BC, he held that volcanoes were directly connected to the center of the Earth, where intense magmatic activity was taking place. It was not until the middle of the 19th century that a truly scientific approach began to emerge. And in 1845, the world's first volcano observatory was set up on the slopes of Vesuvius. Today, the elegant neoclassical building houses a museum dedicated to the history of the observation of Vesuvius. For a long time, the lack of any scientific explanations left the field open to legends and beliefs like those held by the Neapolitans concerning San Gennaro, Saint Genuarius. The history of San Gennaro as Naples' protector from Vesuvius goes back well before the eruption of 1631. They say that even back in 472, during one of the worst eruptions of recorded history, the lava stopped flowing on the very day of San Gennaro's procession. Then, after the eruption of 1631, the mansions located between Naples and Pompeii were decorated with sculptures of San Gennaro. The image of the saint was placed on the side of the house facing Vesuvius, as if to protect it from the volcano's wrath, which he did twice during the long history shared by the city and the volcano. For some, this devotion to San Gennaro, which is celebrated every year in the month of May, represents respect for a popular tradition. For others, it's the expression of deep religious fervor. In a procession that leaves from the Duomo of Naples, the statue of San Gennaro, and even more important, a vial of his blood, is paraded before the faithful. When the blood liquefies, it means the city is protected from the anger of Vesuvius. Mm. 
rimetti a noi i nostri debiti, come noi li rimettiamo ai nostri debitori. E non ci indurre in tentazione, ma liberaci dal male. Dio, Maria, Signore, sei benedetta fra le donne, e benedetto il frutto del tuo seno, Gesù. Santa Maria, Madre di Dio, prega per noi peccatori, adesso è l'ora della nostra morte. Amen. Ave o Maria, piena di grazia. The superstitions were inspired by a few particularly devastating eruptions of Vesuvius, but aside from that, are the Neapolitans really afraid of Vesuvius? Afraid? Let's say that the fear is always there. Such a huge giant like that is always frightening, even if it's been sleeping for years. Let's just hope that it keeps sleeping as long as possible. I live just below Vesuvius, but I've never been afraid because I was born there. If you grow up with it and you've always lived with it, you get used to it. Of course, if the evacuation plan was better, we'd feel a little safer. Pompeii was a thriving city at the beginning of the Christian era. The vineyards, protected by Bacchus, covered the countryside, dominated by the familiar silhouette of Vesuvius, an earthly paradise until those dark days of 79 BC, when, as Pliny the Younger relates, the volcano unleashed its fury. For several days we had experienced earth shocks, which hardly alarmed us, as they are frequent in Campania. But that night they became so violent that it seemed the world was not only shaken, but turned upside down. We also saw the sea sucked away and apparently forced back by the earthquake. On the landward side, a fearful black cloud was rent by forked and quivering bursts of flame and parted to reveal great tongues of fire. You could hear the shrieks of women, the wailing of infants and the shouting of men. Some were calling their parents, others their children or their wives, trying to recognize them by their voices. Pompeii is very close to Vesuvius. The volcano is about seven or eight kilometers from here, in the direction of the prevailing winds. During an eruption, the cinders and ashes spewing from the crater are caught and carried by these winds. Now, Pompeii lies directly in the axis where these winds are the strongest. What in fact kills people and destroys the buildings are the pyroclastic gases, the very hot gases that spill across the area very quickly at ground level. People die from asphyxiation. These gases have such incredible momentum that they topple walls. For a volcanologist like me, Pompeii is a key element in studying the interaction between volcanoes and human life, or how volcanic activity influences daily life. 
Life stopped here, but only for a certain time, then it picked up again, until the next eruption. Everything stops and then starts again, and it's always been like that. We leave Naples and we take one last look at Vesuvius as we head south to the Aeolian Islands. Our first stop in this archipelago of seven volcanic islands is Vulcano. After a night on the boat, we sight the island of Volcano, dominated by the imposing silhouette of its main crater. drop anchor in Porto Levante, the island's only port. Apart from some cruise ships that stop here in the spring and summer season, the only link between Volcano, Sicily and the other islands are the ferry boats and for the past few years, the smaller but much faster hydrofoils. This relative isolation has in a way allowed the 500 inhabitants to preserve a peaceful way of life. Volcano, at least for the time being, has no accommodations suitable for mass tourism. Even though some travelers may come to enjoy the mud baths and the hot springs that flow into the sea, most of them come here above all to see the mythic volcano. Vulcano was uninhabited throughout antiquity because it was considered a sacred island dedicated by the Greeks to the god Hephaestus and then by the Romans to the god Vulcan. Because during those ancient times, the volcano up there behind us was very active. There was very explosive activity, very spectacular. It was known and feared by all the navigators. So it was a sacred island. And why did it remain uninhabited in the Middle Ages? Well, simply because people thought it was one of the gates of hell. Volcano's last eruptions date back to 1888. For two years, the large crater produced extremely violent explosions where huge bombs of cracked lava, known as bread crust bombs, rained down onto the slopes. Since then, the volcano has been sleeping. Certain experts fear, however, that it may be merely dozing.
Meanwhile, every day, brave hikers set out on the trail that crosses ravines and scoria fields and leads right up to the edge of the crater. Smoke coming out of the Fossa Cone, as the main crater is known, is proof that the volcano is still active. On the north side of the crater's mouth, plumes of vapor mark the location of sparkling yellow sulfur crystals. These sulfur vents emit a vapor laden with an irritating and suffocating gas. At the end of each day, the arrival of the ferry connecting Naples with Sicily brings a flurry of activity to the port. We get back on board along with a few tourists and a good number of islanders to continue our discovery of the Aeolian Islands. During the crossing, which lasts a few hours, we get to enjoy a magnificent view of Lipari and Panaria in the light of the setting sun before reaching our next port of call, Stromboli. Stromboli is known as the lighthouse of the Tyrrhenian Sea for its incandescent explosions. As we draw near, the looming mass of the volcano appears exceptionally calm. But this calm is only a facade. Tidal waves, violent explosions, lava flows, Stromboli's activity during the months just before we arrived fully justifies its reputation and warrants the daily monitoring it's subject to. Stromboli is a volcano that rises from the seabed 1,500 meters below the surface. If you add that to the visible part above the surface, you get a height of 2,500 meters. That's a substantial mass, which makes it a major volcano. Stromboli is certainly not a second-class volcano. Thanks. 
Led by our guides, we begin the climb up to the crater, capped by a huge plume of smoke. Stromboli is 924 meters high, but for safety reasons, the summit is at present off limits to the public. No matter, it's still a magnificent sight. Every meter we advance opens up a new panorama, a new view of the sea and the Schiara del Fuoco. The blocks of lava ejected by the mouth of the crater hurtle down this straight slope before plunging into the sea. Stromboli is a rather special volcano on account of its regular activity. The risk entailed in living beneath Stromboli is no greater than when you get into your car and drive on the highway. All the Strombolians have the same attitude regarding this question, which means that living on Stromboli is no more dangerous than living in Milan, in Paris or London. And people who live here are fully aware of all that. Whitewashed houses line streets so narrow that only the scooters can pass. Scari, like the other villages on the island, is imbued with an extraordinary feeling of peace and tranquility. The islanders don't seem to mind living wedged in between sea and volcano, and Gaetano even likes it. It's good to have tourists. It's a good thing, because we live off tourism. They're welcome here. But people have to respect the island, the natural environment, because it's ridiculous just to get off the boat, stay for two hours and then leave. Stromboli deserves better than that. Just look how beautiful it is. Fishing isn't just a job, it's above all a tradition and a feeling. I experience all sorts of things, even very dangerous moments when the sea is really rough. That's the feeling you get from fishing. And there are really amazing moments. All of a sudden there are dolphins swimming by. That type of thing. It's incredible. The sea. We know the sea better than the volcano. 
Yes, we do know the volcano as well. We're not scientists, but we know how to behave with Stromboli. You have to respect it, never get too close. It can be dangerous, especially up there on the mountain. It can be really dangerous. But down here, no. There's no danger for the village. We're safe here, we can sleep soundly. Another night on board brings us to Catania, the main city on the east coast of Sicily, dominated by Mount Etna. There's no comparison between the island of Sicily, with an area of 25,000 square kilometers and a population of 5 million, and the little islands of Vulcano and Stromboli. And yet the personality of Etna, probably the world's most active volcano, is so strong that it's felt throughout the island, starting with Catania which, as they say, trembles every time that Etna sneezes. Catania's fate is totally dependent on Etna's moods, and the visage of this Baroque city, adorned with churches and palazzos, still bears the scars of the terrible eruption of 1669, which buried half the city. And so Catania's main buildings, the Duomo in particular, were built after the catastrophe. Vaccarini was the architect who oversaw the reconstruction of the city. Here in the place of honor, in the center of Piazza del Duomo, surrounded by magnificent palazzos, we see one of his more fanciful creations, Diotru, the baby elephant, who's become the enigmatic symbol of the city. But the true symbolism of this statue lies in the fact that it's made of black basalt from Etna. Etna is alive. In fact, it's the life of the earth. This lava that's inside our globe and which from time to time makes its way to the surface, especially in Etna, which at present is the most active volcano in Europe and probably on earth. There are explosions, mushroom clouds of ash that rise several kilometers high and scatter ash over the whole region, like last winter, when even the airport was closed a good part of the time. Then there are lava flows, this lava that pours out, swells up and you can hear the hiss of the gases escaping. It's just so fascinating. Etna began to form around 500,000 years ago, and it was only 250,000 years ago, more or less, that the volcanic activity coalesced, got organized, so to speak, to create the first major volcano. It was directly over this depression of the Del Bove Valley, which was created in part by the collapse of the ancient volcano, of that series of ancient volcanoes, because there were several, maybe half a dozen. Les premiers témoignages historiques, ils datent dans 
The first accounts date back 2,500 years. Diodorus of Sicily, for example, wrote that at the time of the Sicans, a local population that had settled here more than 3,000 years ago, there were such violent explosions that these original inhabitants had to emigrate towards the western part of Sicily. There were surely very explosive eruptions, perhaps the final phases of the formation of the Del Bove Valley. In all of Etna's recorded history, the eruption of 1669 is the one that left the deepest scars. Witnesses of the time describe the catastrophe as follows. On the 23rd of April, around two o'clock at night, the huge fiery river began to plunge into the sea. Catania's high ramparts resisted the torrent of molten rock but this obstacle only caused the lava to accumulate to such a point that its weight soon overcame the solidity of the walls. The terrible sight of this torrent of fire spilling into the upper part of the city caused one to fear that it would soon inundate the entire city. The millions of tons of material produced by Etna over the centuries have modified the landscape, fertilized the soil and provided building material. Unknown artists even sculpted the lava to give birth to these strange creatures that still decorate the facades of certain houses. Licciardello, in a way, is carrying on this tradition. I use basalt from Monte Gibello for my sculptures. It's a great stone, magic. It always gives me a lot of satisfaction. It lends itself to a certain plasticity that suits my style of sculpture. I don't know why, but I always feel this strange fascination, a sort of magnetism that draws me to this stone. The form that I give to the stone, I have to seek it out in the contortions of the flow, in this magma that moves, writhes, goes through like a whole series of movements and creates veins, like in wood, even if they're not visible. I can feel them through the tool I'm using. You have to respect the inherent movement of the material. Every morning I poke my head out of my bedroom door. I look up, and when I see the plume of smoke, I say to myself, it's going to be a good day, at nice calm, I'll be able to work in peace. The smoke rising from Edna's crater may reassure Licciardello, but there are also a number of other signs that are proof of the volcano's bad temper.
the countryside all around Etna is dotted with small chapels. Constructed after certain eruptions, there are also many signs of gratitude towards God and certain of his saints. In the region of Tre Castagni, they have a particular devotion to Saint Alfio. All these villages venerate Saint Alfio. Many villages have a particular devotion to him. Adrano, Acerielli, Zafirana, Milo. Why? Because in their worst moments of danger, these villages would call upon him for protection. This devotion does not stem from the volcano. Natural phenomena do heighten people's religious feeling. It stimulates and facilitates it. But this faith springs from the people's soul. Of course, in this region where Etna is an ever-present danger, people feel the need to turn to the divinities, just as the inhabitants of the coastal towns would feel the need for a devotion that was linked with the dangers of the sea. Every May, the town of Trecastagni celebrates the feast of its patron saint. The streets of the town are lit up in a carnival atmosphere to welcome the faithful who made the all-night pilgrimage from Catania by foot, an exhausting journey, which they finish by crawling into the church consecrated to Saint Alfio. One of the highlights of the week is the procession, a mixed parade of clergy, fraternities, brass bands, hymns and fireworks. A singular spectacle that looks like something out of a Fellini movie. Today, the Sicilians of Catania province know full well that Etna is still dangerous, that its eruptions can be disastrous. They also know that they have Etna to thank for the richness of the soil and the magnificent crops of fruit, like these lemons that Rosario cultivates with such loving care. Uh, 
Etna has enriched our region in so many ways. It's given us great resources, tourism, but above all the riches of the soil, because Etna's nearly constant volcanic activity produces a volcanic sand that settles onto our soil and nourishes our land. Lemons do amazingly well here, and it's thanks to the fertile soil, and also because there are no thermal shocks. The temperature rarely drops below zero degrees. It can usually get down to around two degrees. If it goes below zero degrees, the lemons really suffer. Down through the millennia that Etna has been in existence, its silhouette has been constantly evolving, shaped by the different eruptions. Every time there are new craters, opening up on the slopes in unexpected places. The eruptions at the beginning of the 2000s have put the latest touches on this masterpiece in constant progress. In July 2001, a fissure opened up after several explosive eruptions of the southeast crater. It's that broken cone, the highest one visible there on the right, which is almost 3,300 meters high. The breach gradually progressed downward, almost to Sapienza at 2,000 meters, for a total length of around 5 kilometers. And on the other slope, we had 2 kilometers of fissure, where the volcano opened up at the same time on the opposite, the northeast slope. La sortie at the exit, the source if you would, the lava can flow at truly frightening speeds. On Etna we've recorded speeds up to 30, 35 kilometers an hour. But as soon as it gets to the surface, the lava cools, becomes covered in a crust, a shell of rocks in formation, and this crust, which is more viscous than the interior, slows down the flow. So rather quickly the speeds drop and are no more than a few meters an hour. In 2001, a lava flow, advancing inexorably at this speed, nearly carried off the base station of the mountain cable car. Day and night, the rescue workers used excavators to build an earthen dam high enough and solid enough to divert the lava flow. Once the eruption was over, 
they began planning the reconstruction of the mountain cable car. But in the autumn of 2002, the volcano began to erupt again. Once again, the whims of Etna had foiled the plans of man. Now you can take a four-wheel drive vehicle trail across the most recent lava fields to reach Etna's slopes. Etna's outbursts of anger are unpredictable, but however violent they may be, they always provide an incredible spectacle of never-ending fascination. At first, there were these plumes of ash called lava fountains, intermittent jets of lava that shoot up like rockets. It was really spectacular. Then, around mid-November, I think it was the 13th to be exact, the explosive activity shifted. Instead of ash-laden gas plumes, we got what are called strombolian explosions which are, in fact, sprays of incandescent projectiles, bits of glowing lava, and this activity subsided. Then, because the magma wasn't being shot into the air, it could rise in the conduit, and it began to form a lava flow at the base of this cone. There was a first flow, then we got a second, a third, and so on, and that activity continued on and off for almost two months. several thousand years ago. In Nola, a few kilometers from Naples, the archaeologist Claude Alboré Livadi has unearthed a group of dwellings dating back to the Bronze Age. The archaeologist and the volcanologist have joined forces in an attempt to describe what happened here. The region was dotted with small farming communities when, in 1800 BC, the extremely violent eruption called the Avellino Pumice eruption took place. A flow of volcanic mud flooded the village and hardened, fixing into a natural mold all sorts of objects and also, for the first time, the form of the dwellings of that period. Right now, in this 1,500 square meter sector at Nola, we have just three houses. More importantly, we have pens for animals and a threshing floor. 
When man is confronted with the mysteries of nature, religion provides answers and the comforting protection of the patron saints, the miracle workers. Down through the centuries, long periods of calm would dim the memory of the deadly eruptions. So people have always lived in the vicinity of the volcanoes of southern Italy. Vesuvius, which seems to be sleeping soundly since its last eruption in 1944, towers over Naples and its suburbs, a metropolitan area of close to two million inhabitants. Numerous quarries have been dug out of the slopes of Vesuvius. March 1944. Allied aircraft are flying over Vesuvius. Impressive wreaths of ash are shooting up from the crater to a height of 5,000 meters. Lava flows are invading the villages of San Sebastian and Massa. The fear and anger of the inhabitants gives way little by little to incomprehension and resignation. For thousands of years, volcanic eruptions were considered an expression of the anger of the gods. In Greco-Roman mythology, they were the home of Vulcan and Hephaestus, the gods of Hades. Then, with the Christian Middle Ages, these same volcanoes were seen as the den of Satan. It took for a lava flow to reach the sea. What was the exact time that the eruption began? When did it stop? A whole set of observations that go into making up a physical model of the eruption. The image of Vesuvius overlooking the Bay of Naples has now become an asset that attracts millions of tourists every year. As for the Neapolitans, they seem less worried about a new eruption than about the traffic congestion in downtown Naples. This same lack of concern may have already been the general attitude for a volcanologist like Claudia Principe, they are like open books on Vesuvius's history. If we observe this quarry from the bottom up, we can see the layers of volcanic deposits over the period AD 472 to 1822. The traces from the 1822 eruption are naturally found on top. But in addition to the field work on a site like this, to really understand a volcano, it's also very important to gather information from the eyewitness accounts of those who lived at the different periods of volcanic activity. These two types of data taken together are really an effective way to get a complete picture of the volcano's history and perhaps understand certain phenomena that didn't leave any traces in the rock, like how long it 